My name is uh, Charlie Hamilton, Rudy Leon, and I'm from, born and raised in Chehalis. I have five children, six grandchildren, one great grandson. I grew up with elders, uh, teaching uh, survival, mostly, and, uh, because a lot of the elders that I grew up with never went to school, and uh, that's uh, like uh, 75 years ago. I've been a logger all my life. Uh, an alcoholic. I, uh, I think uh, 48 years ago when I quit. That was uh, one of the biggest steps I ever made in my life. But I go to quite a few places uh, to speak to children, not about really education, but like I said, survival, how to set up your life that you want to learn. That's uh, what I understand it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Siam Talat. Shirley Leon is my name. My maiden name is Marshan. I'm Okanagan by birth and was born on the Okanagan Band Number no. 1 at Six Mile Creek. <laughs> and, or I was born by Skooka Mine Trail, right on the road. <laughs> Wagon Road in those days. and. Uh, just really happy to be here and happy to be part of this. To me, I think uh, education is very important, no matter what you do. What, it's what you set your mind to, to what you want to, what you want to do by getting educated. But uh, I think, uh, Like, um, you have to set your heart into what you want because a lot of the things that, uh, like teachers or doctors or nurses or whatever, uh, like, uh, if you don't put out from your heart the teaching that you want to put on somebody. Uh, that person doesn't really absorb it. Uh, uh, what I have thinking about last, in the last three weeks, I guess, is uh, because I was very, very sick and uh, the thing I've visioned to see missing in the schools is the prayer. There's no opening prayer anymore in any education or anything that you do. And that, that prayer gives you faith in something gives you faith in yourself that you want to learn and that you want to do something about your education. And, uh, so uh, without prayer, like I said, there's no faith. There's a lot of, lot of people out there that are very, very educated and they don't have faith. They don't care how they treat people. 
they don't, uh, uh, it's just for themselves. They put their hand out instead of just feeling something good that they've done for somebody. They want to get paid. And that's, uh, that's too bad that uh, our things are gone that far away from uh, having faith. That's about all I could say about it. Uh, you know, like I'm not educated myself, and, but uh, to teach uh, to teach somebody something like I, I always bring up that <clears throat> I'm an alcoholic. If the people didn't have faith in me. I would not have sobered up. Spirituality is a way of life. And if you make it your life, you're alone. And that's uh, about all I could say. Thank you. The vision, first of all, is um, trying to look at the indigenous perspective. I, I guess I would like life to be ideal where there was no separation, that any person that wants to be education, educated or go into education, that they go because they have a specific goal and they know what the quality of that goal is as well as the end purpose of that goal and that they go into it with the absolute belief that they're going to do the best that they can do with what they have and not i have a saying that i know i use a little bit too often and that, and that is, is one of my pet peeves is seeing people do things half ass <laughs> and uh I see in education too often um, that we get into education for the pay, for the status, for the prestige. We don't get into it because we want to improve the quality of life and choices for our young people. We don't focus enough on the young people. We tend to look at them as numbers and as um, things that make up a chart to meet our goals. And we don't often see them as human beings. Uh, not every child that comes into your classroom ha brings something with it, whether it's baggage, whether it's um, assets. Uh, they have an experience base, and we don't look at that often enough. And, and that the, whatever is being studied not only have credits and measurements and that, but have quality, the quality and relevancy. Is it relevant to your environment? And just to do the best you can and be the best that you can. The knowledge in education is really um, knowing who you are and where you want to go. And even that is broad, like knowing your roots will give you the confidence to be whatever you can be and take on whatever challenge. Just this week I heard, I uh, had the opportunity in the last couple of years to visit um, Trinity Western University, a university that I always wondered about because I knew they had really high standards there of achievement. And I wondered why a couple of our young people chose to go there but didn't graduate there. And, and thinking that first it would be a religious program and they would still be a very 
would be kind of a double minority. So why would they choose to go there? So when I actually got there and met six indigenous students who seemed very happy to be there, you know, we were greeted with gospel music and songs and a prayer, and it was reinforcing my image of what uh, Trinity Western was, but I didn't expect to see the, the confidence and the, the satisfaction in these six students with hundreds of other students there. And when we had a chance to sit and have lunch with them, had an opportunity to talk with one, and she came from somewhere in Ontario to come. And that's a long way away from your roots to come there. And that same student now, it challenged, she's graduating this, this year with a master's, I think. <clears throat> and she challenged the, um, what would you say, the cr credits, I guess, to ask that she be allowed to do uh, a movie on some topic. And the movie was based on indigenous experience, is based on indigenous experience, but it's, it's also based on, the focus is on indigenous experience, but it's from a, a parable from the Bible. And it's going to be premiering soon in, in March. And I, I, you know, to think, here is this, little person, this little lady, taking on the challenge of this prestigious university and daring to ask for an exception to be made, just overwhelms me and it just gives me such pride in uh, our people. That's what I think needs to happen more often is that we take on the challenges to change things when we see it's out of balance or it's not focused or it's irrelevant. I guess it's to uh, the culture and your traditional things. You have to, if you want to put that out, uh, I always bring this up when I'm speaking that, uh, to our younger people. You talk about what you know, not what you think you know. Culture and tradition is what you're feeding when you go to school. That's, uh, it shouldn't uh, be destroyed by anything that you learn in school. And that's what uh, elders should be uh, aware of, that uh, they should be talking about. Look, I'm not educated, so all I can talk about is the way I survived. I feel, <clears throat> I feel as an elder today, I've been robbed by the government to teach. Like I have a great grandson. I have to do so many things to teach him how to hunt. I have to go through different things to take him in the woods and cut down a tree and teach them how to build a canoe. I can't do that anymore. You know, or even a younger person. To take him out hunting, get his first deer, I have to make sure he has a license for that gun, a permit to hunt, or even fishing. You know, all these has been taken away from me as an elder to teach. When we taught, when we taught uh, 
when I was taught, uh, there was no such thing as a permit. There was no such thing as a license. That was my right. My rights were, and this is, uh, I guess, uh, I keep remembering, uh, I went down to New Zealand. I didn't want to really go, but uh, I went anyway. And uh, Simon Baker was a speaker. And when we got down there, he, he wasn't feeling too good. So he, he asked me to kind of take his place in certain Marais that we went to. And the teaching in the schools as that I witnessed there in the classroom, something like what's going on in there. There was little babies laying on the floor. Either it was language or, or anything. The mother and the baby was in that room. That's where the teaching began, right from a baby being in a cradle. And that's what I witnessed when I was growing up, that uh, because uh, my sisters used to tell me, uh, I remember that, I used to tell them, you can't remember that, you're only three years old. But I remember it, you know. Uh, because it was the teaching that was given to me on a table like this, our meal table. This is where my father and mother used to talk uh, about, I guess, to make us hear uh, how to live how to learn, you know, um, a long time ago, there was no such thing as wrong. We were never ever wrong. If we did something that didn't go the right way, we just had to do it over. Our parents said, well, you just do it over again the next time it might be better. And the teaching that I remember today is that I had cousins living about three or four hundred yards away from me. They used to come and play with me. <clears throat> and I heard them coming and I wanted to go out right away and we used to play outside there. My mother said, don't forget you got a chore to do. You got to fill that wood box with wood before you can go play with those kids. So I ran out in the woodshed and ran in and just threw the wood in the wood box. It didn't matter how it was laid. I didn't line it up or anything. So the wood box filled up real quick. And then I was going to go and my mom called me back. She said, look, you take this wood, you bring it out back in the wood shed, you bring it back in again, and you pile it up properly before you can go out and play. By then, my cousins were gone home. <laughs> so that was a teaching. It's, and that's the thing I followed when I was an elder on the Quiquilstam. That's how all these things is what I brought out to teach people, our younger generation that was in trouble, like say with poaching, fishing or whatever, or stealing. Uh, they weren't punished by one person. They weren't punished. They had to make up for what they'd done, not just pay a fine or whatever, that uh, 
just to pay a fine doesn't fix it. It's, uh, so I think that uh, our elders group that we have today is, uh, is a good thing to keep reminding us. Like my wife said, uh, the thing that I was taught is who you are, what you are, and where you come from. My dad said, if you apply that to your life and live it, no matter what you do or anything, people will, will respect you. I thought that over for years and years. And I thought of, who am I? So I started saying, I am Shwale Maltach. My name is Rudy Leon. Who are you? Is what I make myself. Where do I come from? I'm registered in Chehalis, and that's not where I come from. I come from right here, from the spirit. That's who you are, what you are, and where you come from. My favorite one is always the um, storytelling. And I remember when my three little munchkins were just babies and we were traveling and we we ran out of stories and we were we just happened to be passing by um, was it moose no sycamus sycamus in the interior and uh, so we we asked Grandpa to tell a story, and he's, he must have noticed the sign because he said, "Oh yeah, I got a really good story." He said, uh, the, "You know the people around here they live on moose. There's lots of moose in this country, and you know they they have lots of snow in the winter. One winter they were all snowed in for months and months, and they couldn't get out to hunt." pheasants or whatever other kind of animals they had. So they had to live on all the moose meat that they put away. And, and this guy was walking through the village and all he kept hearing was, oh, I'm so sick of moose. I'm so <laughs> sick of moose. <laughs> so when it came time to start naming these communities for the government to put it on the maps, they asked, what, what's the name of this place? And, and they said, it's Sycamus. <laughs> <laughs> I just love hearing that because that, that talent or that gift is gone. We don't have elders that can spontaneously tell a story that's going to be significant and it's going to have a message. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of stories I heard. And uh, as I guess growing older and older that when I heard them I thought they were true. But uh it was just something to <clears throat> to remind us, I guess, of who we are. Um, it's so important to not change your story. Uh, I've heard stories told to me 
And then there was a write-up in, in, uh, in a book from Kokolitsa. And when I read that, it was different. You know, uh, the story was different. I guess to teach somebody how to live the difference between right and wrong. is uh, very, very important to make a, a child understand. And your grandma here, you used to, when I first started sobering up, she used to say, you feel like talking? I said, yeah, I said, you will talk. So we'd sit down and talk. By the time we finished talking, we were kind of disagreeing with each other. This went on for quite some time. One day I come home from work and I was really, really tired and upset about something. She said, oh, you feel like talking? I said, yeah. We sat down and I said, but this time, let's talk about what's right and what's wrong, not who's right and who's wrong. That's uh, like I said a long time ago, nobody was in the wrong. If you see a, ch a child misbehaving, it's not that child's fault, it's the parents. The parents are not teaching that child how to act or anything. That's uh, this is what's completely gone in our ways. It's, uh, there's no long time ago. There's no such allow any child to run around in the house or anywhere or scream and holler for nothing. That was a no-no. I guess it's because uh, they might hear something that the elders were talking about and it'll stick there for the rest of their life. One word. That's what I say. Uh, somebody hears one word and it hits them and they keep applying it to their life, and then it becomes a part of their life. And it's uh, how to be honest, not to steal, cheat, or whatever. You know, uh, that's all not here anymore. It's, uh, it's, uh, So I think uh, teaching is, uh, you teach somebody that's having a hard time to make it easier for them to learn, like in school. Like, uh, like I heard a long time ago, life begins at home, teaching begins at home. That's not here anymore. Uh, like kids uh, don't go home and tell their parents of what they learned or what they experienced at school anymore. To punish a child, 
uh, I see this happening today. I see a lot of, I'm going to do this, I'm going to send you to your room. They keep doing it, they get sent to their room. They get in their room, they got iPads, TV, everything that is, you know, and that's punishment. <laughs> so, I don't know. That experience, like I said, is, is uh, a way to learn. It's not, not out of line to, to ask anybody, how did you do that? How did that come about? What made you think of that? Oh, that's, that's freedom of life. My grandchildren are at childbearing age now. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that Suleim Altov reminded me of was how the consequences of parents and grandparents were dealt with in the, in the um, I guess, still the subsistence era. Because if a child misbehaved when, you, when there was a gathering in the longhouse, um, there would be two people, and it didn't have to be a, a family member. Two people in the small, the, the longhouse would see this misbehavior of a child happening. So they would quietly go outside and, and get a pole. One of them would go outside and get a pole and stand in the middle of the floor, while the other one would go and tie a a string on two people's or four people's left arm and not a word would be said and that pole would be dropped right in front of the parents that whose child was misbehaving and so this the that meant that within two years that family had to put on a gathering to apologize for that child's misbehavior in public, in a public gathering. I mean, that's how simple and, um, but very strict the teachings were in those days. And now we scream and yell the same thing over and over, you know, at a misbehaving child. And he, he or she still does it. Doesn't matter how loud you holler, how much you scream. <laughs> So we got to think hard and long about uh, what kind of teachings we give our young people to carry on with their children. So that, that breaks that cycle. With, with my children, we never had to lift our boys. The grandmother, um, their paternal grandmother was the one that taught them. I never heard that lady ever raise her voice. and. I had five children. Every time we'd go out in, into a public place, there wasn't a word of scolding or screaming, or if a child was going to do something, they would automatically look at Grandma, and Grandma would either shake her head or nod it. And they knew. Not a word. And that, if you told somebody that today, they'd think you're nuts, you know, you're not <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> or that was way back then. But I, I still believe those teachings can still work. What would I say to my grandkids and great-grandson? I see them the way they're acting. I tell them, uh, my kids were never like that. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I have it pretty well all written down in writing a book and, uh, about how, how much change has happened since, like I said, 75 years ago. <clears throat> I, uh, talking to 
known me for one one uh, one supper time, and I said, "You know what I've been thinking about?" I said, "I wonder what would happen if I went to this high school up here in Agassiz and picked out ten of our native people." that are in high school and we hire a helicopter and blindfold them, put them on a helicopter and fly them way back in the woods. I wonder how they survive. We just dumped them off. You know, what, what do they do to survive, to get out of there, to find their direction or what to eat? You know, <clears throat> I was taught how to find your direction in the dark, just by feeling the tree. East. Is the side you feel. On the east side of a tree, there's always moss grows on the east side of a tree. And then you knew your direction where east was and where you had to go. And never to try to follow a creek or something going down. Or it'll take you in the wrong direction. A lot of these teachings I didn't believe. One time I went hunting. And I landed a canoe. I went up the mountain. And I go back, go back down to my canoe. I'd walk and walk and pretty soon I'd look down. Oh, I was here before. And my canoe was down there. I take right off. Pretty soon I come back to the same place. I said, This can't be. So there was a rotten log there. I kicked it and busted it all up to leave a mark. So I went again. I came right back to the same place. The teaching that my dad told me if this happens to you, instead of going that way, Turn around and go back. I, I turned around and I went back. I went right to my canoe. It's the way your mind is. It's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> the first deer I got. I was so excited. I all the teachings that I said I learned. My dad never took me out in the mountain and showed me how to do that. He just told me, told me, you go here, you go there, you're going to see a big bluff, you're going to see a rotten nest snag. <clears throat> I think I was nine years old. Four days in a row I went out, tried to get my first year, and it was snowing. The fourth day I went out, my mother made me a, a thing to tie around my waist, a sandwich in it. And, uh, and my dad told me, if you go out there, you got to start thinking like a deer. And he said, uh, I'll tell you something that you're going to see in, in your life. He said, if you walk over this, come to this bluff, you walk there and you look down, and if you see a deer laying down, you look at it. He doesn't have to hear you, smell you, but that deer will jump up and look around. It's just your eyesight. That deer knows 
that there's somebody looking at him. It was the fourth day I went out hunting. It was about, this was in the winter time, it could start pretty early. I think about 3.30 or something like that, I stopped and ate my sandwich. I was standing there in this open area. I was eating my sandwich and God, I felt like there was somebody looking at me. I turned and looked. There's this great big deer standing there. I up and I shot and I missed it. I was so excited. The second time I shot, I knocked him down. And I didn't get home till 12 o'clock that night. I got the deer down at the bottom of the hill, close to the canoe. By then there was about three feet of snow, but I would not leave that deer behind. No way. I got down to the bottom of the hill. I looked at it, oh my gun. I turned around and run all the way back up the hill again. I got there, my gun was leaning against the tree. My pocket knife was stuck in the tree. And I ran down. Shuffled the canoe out with a paddle, so much snow. By the time I got to the slough where we go in, they call it Leon Slough. I landed in there, and uh, by this time my deer is getting stiff. I had a hell of a time to get them out of the canoe. I started dragging it backwards. I couldn't drag it, just drag it. I turned around and pulled up a little bit at a time. All of a sudden I heard, heard a shot. <clears throat> I knew it was my dad. I loaded a gun and I shot back. And when I got just a little ways and I seen a light coming. He had a lantern. He was on snowshoes. Oh, you got me. Yeah, that's all he said. He had an extra pair of snowshoes. He gave it to me. He said, don't you ever leave home without these when it's snowing. That's all he said. The next morning, he said, well, I'll teach you how to skin it and cut it up. Went out in the morning, we skinned it, cut it all up. We had used to have all these sacks. My mom used to wash them so we could put things in here. He said, you go in there and get 12 sacks. So I went in and got and cut that deer up. We put all pieces in each sack. He said, you, you harness up the horse you go down in the reserve and you give it a speech to all your elders. All of it? Yeah, he said. <laughs> so I went, I did it. When I got back, he had lunch ready for me. And all I had to eat out of that deer was a boiled potato and the heart of the deer. Then he said, I want you to go out in the mountain, out in the bushes, and you get uh, what this size, a vine maple, real straight, he said. So I went out, came in, uh, brought it, no, not good enough. Go get a good one, away I'd go again. I don't know how many times I, I went and find the egg. I found him good enough, I guess. My dad made a fire. He shoved his vine maple underneath the fire, put it in the snow underneath. It got so hot you couldn't bend it. That's what he made me do. He made me 
to remind me of not to forget snowshoes at home. <laughs> he made me make my own. That's, uh, that's how oh. our teaching went on. The hardest part, I guess, was I had to drink the blood of the deer. Just burn you up. <laughs> Just get your body real hot. And that's what I say is missing with our kids. What I'm robbed of. And I asked him, How come I had to give all that meat away? He said, That's the way it is. And the next time you go out, you'll always be lucky. And he pushed that on us even when we were married already. He used to always say to us, there is such thing as good luck. And the way he showed us, showed us that, he used to bring us down here to Chinatown to have a Chinese meal <laughs> to treat us. He said to us, Gives you good luck if you feed people. That's where I've seen him real happy because he, my dad was only five foot one. And the owner, he was a good friend of his, the owner of the whole inn was shorter than him. <laughs> <laughs> He used to pat that little Chinese guy in the head. <laughs> but I see things are starting to happen, like all these schools are inviting elders now. That's a good thing. They might have or not have the right answers for you, like me, but they have the ears to listen and the heart to put out, showing that they care.